Sarah, and I'm going to borrow a bit from our speaker last night, and I'm going to tell you that I am not an expert, so we'll start off with one. Not, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a teacher, I am not um, a psychiatrist. Who I am is someone who has worked with kids with disabilities in some capacity since I was 16 years old. Um, and my daughter came to camp when she was a fourth grader and fell in love with camp. And when my younger daughter wanted to come to camp, I realized that maybe I should come and find out what made camp so awesome. So I started counseling. And in that capacity, I noticed that we are getting more and more conferees with some sort of a special need, whether it's that they're on the autism spectrum, that they have ADHD, that they have social anxiety. There's something there, and that parents are not always 100% honest with us <laughs> about what their child's needs might be. Um, and there is nothing worse than having it be Sunday night and you finding out that you have a camper who you're not quite sure what you can do to have them be successful at camp. So I thought that I would use the little bit of knowledge that I have to put together a little something to put some tools in your toolbox. Um, because if you don't have experience with people with some of these social thinking difficulties, you're not going to be able to reach into your bag and say, this is what I'm going to do. Um, so our first tip, and this is really, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. Say exactly what you want. Um, if you don't want the kids to run, but you want them to walk, tell them to walk. Um, please walk. If you don't, and you go, guys, don't run, you're going to get somebody like, okay! Um, because that's not running, that's hopping. Um, you definitely want to let them know what you want. Um, if I told you guys that Thursday night I went to the pizza shop and I got something that was made with two pieces of bread and had some meat and cheese and <coughs> vegetables inside of it. What did I get for dinner? Okay, what did you say? Okay. A grinder. A grinder. Mm -hmm. If I was in Philly and I said that, they would tell me, oh, you got a hoagie. Yeah, if I'm in Seattle, oh, you got a sub. We're all talking the same language, but are we really? You know, um, we can discern that. A kid with, that thinks differently might not be able to figure that stuff out. So you imagine that you hear the words, you understand the language, but what someone's saying to you isn't making any sense at all. Do you think you might feel a little bit anxious? Um, it's, you're gonna be frustrated. You're doing a group activity, and one of your kids is off in the back, they're not participating. You kind of know that he doesn't get what's going on, and he's asking questions, but he's not asking the right questions. Um, you know, you may want to rethink the things that you're telling them to do. So you're going to use your very specific language. You're going to say, you know, if you're doing a song and you say, from the top, you might have something to do with, from the top of what? Um, their kids with social thinking difficulties are very liberal. Um, and so you need to, again, it goes back and say what you mean. Um, that slang and those sayings don't always mean the same thing. They may mean nothing at all. Content-specific vocabulary can be very tricky for a kid who is very, very little. So those words that you always use because it's the language of what you do may be very confusing for a kid who doesn't speak the language. Yes. Can I add to you? This is a comfort thing for all kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't a bad thing I have found to practice with all kids. Right. So when my older daughter, who just is one of those really flighty kids who who can benefit from this kind of language. She kind of taught me to speak this way. And then my other daughter's really socially aware, totally gets everything that everybody needs, still benefits. You can tell she's still, she just she knows exactly what's expected. She knows exactly where she needs to be because it's phrased positively. This is what I want you to do instead of what we don't want to do. And yes, there's a joke in our house, the pink elephant. Don't think of pink elephants. And then like immediately in your head, you think of a pink elephant, you can't get it out of your head. The don'ts are all that. Right. right. Don't run makes them want to run. Don't touch that thing makes them want to touch it. Don't go near the fire. <laughs> go near the fire. So exactly. Phrase it with what you want because they don't hear the don't. Right. Um, and then try and phrase.
rearrange your directions in a couple of different ways. One of the things I was thinking with this too is that um, if something is out of the context of their the, of their worldview, they may not know how to figure out what you're saying. So you, know, you tell a kid that you're going to drumming class, and you go to drumming class, and you're then they're handed a water bottle. Um, that it's not a drum. So you might need to explain to your camper that this is a you know this is what we're using as a drum, um, and it, you know it makes perfect sense to all of us, but if they can't fit it into their worldview, again, it's so much easier to just not do something than to say to someone, <coughs> I don't get it. Um, I think, can, I, can I give you a perfect example of that yes. specific problem? I, have, I teach fencing, mm -hmm. and I have a high, very, very high fence, uh, functioning um, kid on the spectrum. And uh, he's, he's very good at listening to directions and following directions. He has no problem with that. One of my coaches took over one of my lessons one day and worked him through this lesson, and he got really good at what he was doing. And my co the other coach said to him, "Okay, now go get Noah, another fencer, meaning go get him. go get on that strip and go win that bout." And he walked over to Noah and grabbed him and brought him back to the coach right. and said, "Here he is." <laughs> yep. And it was that simple. And, and the coach looked at him for a second and went, "Oh, I meant it. go beat him." <laughs> right. Exa and that's exactly that's it. You know, we it's we no I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> but we do we think in a certain way and it, it's definitely you have to take a step back and go, okay, why isn't this working? What can I do to help my camper be successful? Um, another I was gonna say this the same thing holds true, the camp culture. I, I mean I don't think we realize as longtime Silver Lakers, sometimes with with kids that are here for the first time they're not into the lingo, right. you know, even something as simple as, you know, the bathroom between the Freds. I mean, so many things that we take for granted here, you know, a lot of the needs are former staff, and like, we get so used to it, but for a little kid who's here for a second time, like, it's, it's scary. There are adults talking this language they don't understand. Um, you know, one of the things like, that I thought of last night was um, a lot of us use the brush and flush. Yeah. Brush what? Do I use the toilet before I flush it? Do I flush it before I use it and then flush it again? What do you mean by brush and flush? Um, Please don't brush the thing you flush. That too. Because, yeah. you know, or are they going to go brush their hair? Because that's, you know. Um, so you might get kids, whether they are typical thinkers or they're not thinking in the same way as, as you are, that are saying, I don't get it. What do you mean we're going to the friends? So at least the first couple days, I would. You know, I would use the language that we're used to and the camp culture language as well. Even if it feels silly and redundant, I think it helps people feel a little bit more comfortable in their, in their situation. Um, another scenario, young lady who doesn't quite know what to do during that free time that we have where the kids are doing little things while we're touching base with the deans, with the counselors, or whatnot. Um, not only that, she's right in your face, wanting to be talking to the adults. Um, and so what do you do with that? Um, especially our conferees who come who may have what used to be known as Asperger's syndrome, they're much more comfortable in the um, company of adults. It's just sort of the way that it is. Um, give her choices. We've got kids playing ball, we've got kids hula hooping, somebody will pick one and go do that. And if we can't, if you can't just pick one, here, let me bring you over and introduce you again, or just say, hey guys, let, let's let family join the game. Um, and that will help because she's looking at these going, I, I, I don't know how to join, I don't know if they're gonna let me join, I don't, so I'm gonna go to my comfort zone, um, which is the adults, because they're not gonna laugh at me, they're not gonna tell me no, they're not gonna, um, and whether or not the kids have ever laughed at them. There have been times in, in, in our conferees' lives where they've been, I don't want to say marginalized, but not brought in with open arms. Yes. So. Sarah, they're just that, that's kind of like the lunch table syndrome. I mean, you know, yeah. you don't, and that's why um, I specifically 
tell people what groups they're going to be in. I mean, they can sign up for whatever, but they have to be in a group, and they don't sign up with their friends because we sign up on Sunday night when they don't really even know each other. <laughs> and so they really don't have any idea when they're going to skits or whatever who's going to be in that. Um, and, and I think it's really valuable and really helpful to the shy kids and the kids that are marginalized and the kids that don't really know what's going you know, any kid that has any sort of problems whatsoever is going to feel way more comfortable if they're assigned to a place than if you say, oh, go do whatever. Right, exactly. Use your natural leaders. Um, you're going to have kids who are natural leaders and you can give them that, you know, empower them to, you know what, if you notice that one of our friends is having trouble joining, please, Will you help me by bringing them into your group? Um, if you notice that Joey's not not with us, would you would you try and explain what's going on? You know, help me. You know, and and because our natural leaders love to help. You know, that's sort of what they want to do. So if you can use that, do. Um, the nice thing is that's a two for. Right. Yeah, that's fantastic. It helps. It helps that your your leaders learn to lead, being given a direction because. What I've noticed is that some of our natural leaders tend to come off as bossy because they're trying, they're learning how to lead. So it gives them a direction on how to do that. This is a big one. Um, that kids with social thinking problems, not problems, social thinking difficulties have trouble managing the scope of a problem. So you've got a camper who, you, you know, you say, you might just go, you know what, right now I can't do this and keep burst into tears because you don't want to talk to him or you were mean to him or you did this. And you're thinking, all I said was that I needed him to wait. <laughs> and your mind is blown because it's not, you think that the problem is this big. He thinks it's this big. And this is kind of a harder one to deal with because if you've got a kid in full blown meltdown mode, you can't talk them out of it. Um, if you can, you can try and work it through you may need to take them out of the situation um, because they can't disrupt the entire conference either. You know, take a walk to the chaplain, uh, go see the chickens, do something to sort of bring them out of the situation, stop it. Have some calm, calming techniques in your pocket to pull out. Um, had a concrete last year who did really well with the deep breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth when we could see him building and building and building. Um, and it's not, not going to take long for you to, to pick up which kids are having have trouble with that, and you might be able to stop a reaction before it starts because you notice what the reaction looks like when it's starting. Does that make sense? Um, so your toolbox. Use your direct and specific language. Tell them what to do. Don't rely on facial expressions. Um, and I'm famous for this. I, I look at people and I'm like, my daughter doesn't get that. And I'm like, and, and she, all of a sudden she'll be like, but I didn't know you were angry with me. I'm like, really? Because that looked like the face of a happy mommy? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you kind of have to, you know, again, use your words. As much as we like to tell our, the kids to use their words, we need to use our words too. I need you to stop doing that. I didn't, you know. That's not, that's not working in our, you know, that's not a good way for us to build our community. Whatever language that you would like to use to do whatever, positive language as well, like Wendy was saying. Um, and even, even if you see some, one of your countries who has been having trouble and you, and you notice that they're doing something right, catch them being good. I love the way that you did X, Y, and Z. Um, especially if it's one of the kids that's been having trouble be the cheerleader, be the be you know over the top, and you and you'll feel silly doing it. And I know you will because I do all the time. But I love that. I love how you do that because they'll feel, especially if when they're home, all they hear is the stuff that they don't do well. If they've got a somebody that they are you know looking up to, going, that was awesome. I love how you did that. It just means a ton to them. Oh, and prepare them for what's coming up. And I know that we posted a schedule, and I think that almost everybody does. If you find that you've got a kiddo that knows the schedule after the first day, blah, 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 prepare them 
if it's going to change as far in advance, you know, not two minutes before, oh yeah, we were gonna go to this, but now we're gonna go to that because our kids can't switch gears that fast. It's changed one of the most difficult things yes. kids have to do. So, um, yes. And I just wanna echo that for the littler ones too. Yes. If anybody here has a fourth and fifth graders, just in general, not only are they younger, but they're new, largely new to Silver Lake, and they, I mean, I, I knew the schedule would posting the schedule would be important, but it like it's super important super to the important. to the point to the point too. This is one trick if you don't already do it. Put up tomorrow's schedule the night before, so that if it rains or blah blah blah, they're they they were not oh my god, I'm so looking forward to high rocks and now we're doing a movie. What happened? And then you've got questions about it. Don't just just don't go there. So I put it up just yeah. the night before. This is what we're doing, and I don't even necessarily put the time. I've noticed that they will be happy with just knowing that at some point today we're having a campfire. They don't really much guess. Some point today we're doing high ropes. Some point today we are going down to the lake for dip. So I actually just put highlights on the page. This is part of this. And then the daily general schedule. Yeah. So the kids that want time. Have time. And some of your kids that won't be enough. And you can, if, you know, you, you could maybe give them a smaller thing with some times as long as you. They know and are aware. No, so I'm saying it's like post with times, general. Like this okay. is activity time. Right. This is interest group time. This is night yeah. activity, but you're not saying what that night activity is yet. Mm -hmm. The what comes the night before. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay. But there are some children who actually need the time. Everything. They, they need, need the time. They, they need the specific time. At 12 o'clock, we're going to go here. And that's good too. So, you know, but if you don't want to put that up on your schedule because most of your kids don't need that. Little pad of paper that says, you know, eleven o'clock is general interest group. It, and if you don't want to do it for your whole conference, if you're a person who likes to, to leave a little bit of mystery out there, you can always give that kid a piece of paper seven yeah. that says, okay, yeah. this will I know this will help you out or maybe just or give their counselor, if you have a counselor can be right. the um we also last summer we had a couple of kids who really, really to know the time schedule and everything, and like to the point where they would be asking you, you know, what time are we doing this? What's next? Like mm -hmm. five to one, every five minutes. And so we would just give them five minutes in the morning. It's like, here's paper, copy it down. If you yep. don't know during the day, carry it with you. Yep. Otherwise, just roll with it. You know, did they love that? They did love that. Mm -hmm. The ones who it mattered to did it, you know, mm -hmm. and then the other ones just chilled out. Yeah, so. and that's a great example of knowing your audience and knowing what you need. So, um, this was struck me because of a situation that we had last year so that you know we all like to be heard and you can't always fix the problem but just being just hearing that child listening and really hearing them not okay yep yep mm -hmm, okay i heard you yep yep really hearing what they want means the world to them um and can i add to that yes without judging Right, without that era of really, you were thinking that, yep. you, you know, and just really just hearing about the reaction. So this was this was last year. We had a kiddo who was, you know, the, the deans were trying to deal with something, and I don't remember what the issue was, but they needed to deal with it. And the kiddo went up, and and he was not yelled at, <laughs> but he thought that he was, and began to act out because he was feeling like nobody was listening to him, nobody was hearing him, and nobody cared. Um, so what do you do? You need to deal with the issue, but now you've got, it's compounded. Tag out. This is, use your codings, use counselors, use a staff member if you need to. Chaplain. Use chocolate? Chaplain. Chaplain. Oh, chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not bad. <laughs> um, Works for me. I'm going to all day. <laughs> and, and let let your camera talk to you. Let them, you know, um, I was the person that was tagged for this. And we walked walk to Waterfall Chapel. I just let them talk. I listened. Um, and, I, and, and, and I just kept saying, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. I understand you're frustrated. I hear you. By the time we got back to camp, he was like a new kid. Um, and I couldn't change what was going on. I did, he was... The issue was still the issue, but just that somebody had taken the time to just hear him was huge. But in going back to Charlie, mm -hmm. yeah. I would recommend that you don't walk to the waterfall chapel. Yeah. 
Unless you bring someone out. I think that we do. Ball field, picnic tables, those places are great. If they're right at high ropes, so you're in visual. Yeah, just going for a place that. Yeah, and then he, that was one of the things that he said, I want to go see it, I want to go see it. And it had not. a calming spot for it as well. And if you're in sight of others, that's fine. Right, yeah. Just reminding, because Charlie would. Yeah, right. No, I appreciate it. Um, and if you have to disagree, because sometimes they're not, their idea of what needs to happen is not what really needs to happen. Um, so, you know what, I hear what you're saying, I understand your frustration, I'm sorry if my words or tone upset you. Um, you know, we can own that we might have upset them, and that doesn't take away our um, authority or whatever. Even, and it doesn't give them power either because you're saying, you know what, I, I, I own that maybe my tone upset you, but I still can't let you go jump off of the balcony or whatever. <laughs> Question? Yes. That one thing that's really important to remind um, yourself and some of your younger counselors who might be first time with this is that when they're having these conversations, I hear you and this is what I need from you, is to remind them to think about their face and what mm -hmm. their face is. And that sounds yes. really silly to say it. No, no, no. But yeah. I've had conversations with, or I've seen conversations with kids happen, and they don't come out the way the young person wants them to come out because in their mind, they're like, oh, this kid is just like really bothering me. And that comes out of their face. Yes. So just a simple a, a tip is just to remember things. About your face. What is your face doing? Yeah. Are you showing your frustration, or did you give yourself that time to take a deep breath? Exactly. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Be full of understanding. You can, and it can be as simple as the words you're using. I I ran into a kid last year, who, um, you know, was clearly very skilled at finding the right buttons to push, and and got to a point where I was brought in, and I went in, and. In as calm and, you know, this is business as usual as I could, stated clearly what he needed to do. And I kept using the words, you need to and you need to, not realizing those were his triggers. Mm -hmm. right. He didn't want to be told, you right. need to. And it escalated. I couldn't understand. I'm like, I'm not escalating this. I'm, I'm as calm as can be. What's going on? And it kept going. Again. And it wasn't until Chris Marischuk came in and talked with him for a minute. And he figured it out as he was working. He's like... You can't tell him what he needs to do because that's the trigger. But if you tell him what you want, mm -hmm. and then we started using that language and we didn't have a problem the rest of the week. Yeah. So, it, and I, I had no way of recognizing that until Chris stepped in. No. So. And, that, and so definitely, you know, use your, use your resources because we have them here. Um, and I think that sometimes you don't forget that the chaplain is there, but we forget that the chaplain is there. So, you know, use that resource. Use, you know, it's, it, it's, it's very overwhelming, when, if, especially if you've got a conference with a couple of kids who have different needs and you're trying to balance all of this along with your so-called neurotypical kids, you know, that, are, that fit in the box that you expect them to fit in. Um, so it's, but, Social thinking is, a, is it's, it's an education technique that I pulled all of this information from. Kids aren't bad. They think differently than we do. Find out the, what they're thinking and why they're thinking it, and you can work with that. Um, and that's not always, it's not easily said as done, like you were saying with the, the language. Once you found that out, you know, he wasn't a bad kid. He just was thinking differently than you we're thinking, so you've got to sort of mesh those things together. Um, Be willing to go back to your toolbox three, four, five times yes. to try to solve a problem. Uh, that first, you you relied on you, you that's your best tool, just didn't work. You've got to be willing to go between two, three, four, right. five, yeah. in a lot of cases, to get to that. Um, so so I, I took all of my resources from this website, um, the social thinking website. There's tips for volunteers on there um, that are that are geared very much towards people who have short-term limited contact with kids with social thinking difficulties that are not teachers, therapists, things like that. Um, so if you're interested in more ideas, that's where you would go. 
My other big thing um, is I'm a huge believer in person first um, terminology, where you, because I think that we're all a sum of all of our parts, and when you say the autistic kid, the gifted kid, the depressed kid, you're making them one thing rather than that's just a part of who they are. It's, you know, I have a camper with autism. I have a camper with social anxiety. Um, it's just sort of a way to, to, uh, to put the vernacular into a respectful way that you're looking at the whole person and not just what's wrong with that. Um, I'd like so. to take that one step further. Um, I attended a seminar uh, last year uh, with a lady who, and I can't remember her name for the life of me, but she was awesome. And she said, everybody's different. Like, everybody's different. We don't, we don't want to label people anymore. We don't want to put that, you know, the, even a camper with autism. Mm -hmm. that, that's too much because it's a camper who, you know, needs to know the schedule. It's a camper who, you know, has these things that have to be in place before they do something or whatever. And we all have those things. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, everybody is on the spectrum. Um, <laughs> and we all have our little, you know, foibles or whatever. Well, I have to put my shoes on left foot first and then right. You know, I mean, you don't think about it because you're like, oh, I'm normal. But what's normal? There is no normal. Everybody is normal and everybody has different things. Um, and if you just think about, you know, what the strengths and weaknesses of each person are, all of these kids, there's not a kid out there that's all weakness. Right. You know, they, they have their strengths. They have their, you know, things that you can really like. If you can find those things and make them feel valued, um, then, you know, they're going to be really fine. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I just wanted to say was on the topic of language, just going back, be careful with sarcasm. Yes. Um, yeah. That is so, you know, because I had a counselor last year who, she's very young, and she got very frustrated with her room. They wouldn't quiet down to go to sleep. She's like, oh, just count the tiles on the ceiling. Well, she yeah. had a girl who counted the tiles on the ceiling because she was taking things literally, and she didn't realize it, and she was too young to even understand the whole concept behind it or whatever. And when she found out later she actually had counted the tiles on the ceiling, and the girl came up to her and said, I counted 100 and whatever it was, and is that right? And she was like, uh... <laughs> How did she respond? What did she do? Because hopefully she went... Wow! I've never had anyone no. get the right answer. Right, before. right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> I get freaked out and went, oh my gosh, I didn't, I, yeah. I'm so sorry. I, you know, and, yeah. and of course it was a comment, but it was too late. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, and, and mm -hmm. when people ask me if sarcasm is my second language, my answer is often, oh no, honey, well, it's my first. first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I really have to keep that in check. And so it's, it's good to have somebody else point that out because. Like I said, I, I live with it. So, like, you know, I'll say something sarcastic in my 14 year old group. You know, she freaks out because she doesn't quite, she knows that I don't really mean what I've said, but she can't quite put that into her, her view and how it works. So I. And, and most kids don't get sarcastic no. until they're older than we think that right. they need to be in order to yeah. understand our sarcasm. I was going to say, mine certainly does. Yeah. <laughs> but she learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are there any tips at all about kids who don't want to participate? Find out why, first and foremost, because there's probably a reason behind it. Um, unless, unless their parents said, you must go to camp because X, Y, and Z, there's, they probably wanted to be here and they just don't know how to be here. Um, so find out why they're not participating. Um, it might be that, that there's too many people there, that they, you know, that they don't understand the directions, that it, something does, isn't making sense to them, because like I said, it's much, much easier to just go, can't make me do it, than to admit that you don't get something that everyone else does. Um, making the assistant coach. Keep them on the periphery at the very, very least, making the assistant coach. Or give them a buddy, like have yeah. a counselor be yeah. Right. Even or an, like or another yeah, meeting, like, yeah. Chelsea and I are going to go together when we meet in the middle and say, my favorite color is blue. Right. Or Sometimes yeah. it's a power thing, too, giving them two choices that both are perfectly acceptable and letting them choose yes. what they want. They feel like they have a say. Yeah. 
And then yeah. there's the kid who's the introvert who has had their max for the day, mm -hmm. and they need They're space. Right. Yeah. Right. And they need, that we need yeah. to give them a safe place, in our minds, a safe place, give them an option of where they can go. Right. Yeah, that's Did you get space, 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 space in the yeah. common room for when we were all in the common room? But we had one I set board. it up front as a safe, as to make, yeah. I, I have a thing about the introverted, extroverted thing at Silver Lake, which is that sort of a side topic. but. Um, I think it relates here because if you have a child who also is struggling, whether because they're new or because they're young or because they're introverted, to be at Silver Lake with all of our safe care policy and be introverted is really hard. And the more introverted you are, the more a drain of an entire packed schedule of rah-rah activity is for you. That quiet time becomes sacred time yeah, yeah, yeah. because it is the only time they their buckets start to fill up because it's quiet and they can just read. So what I do to try and augment is when we have some interest group time, um, I usually want option. I give an option thinking in my head, this is the quiet introverted activity and this is the active noisy activity. I try and do that um, some days, I can't do it all days. And on Sunday, I designate one couch with a special throw on it that's like a leopard print thing. And I say that's for when anybody, that should, and they all end up sitting on it anyway. It's a safety thing, okay? I just say it up front. If anybody's feeling like they've had enough, go sit over there. And that's the, I wanna just sit here and do nothing. And so it gives them the permission up front to be the one to just like, okay, I need, I need a few minutes. But not somebody, because the last thing you need, when you feel like you need space away, is a dean who comes up and says, what's up? And then a counselor who comes up and says, what's up? And then, don't you want to go for a few these kids? Come on, don't you want to, how, how come you're sitting here? And then a conferee comes in and asks you what's up. It's like, can you just leave it works? Right, so that is the designated, I'm chilling out over here. Yeah. Space. Yeah, the opposite. Is it okay if I sit with you? I'm not trying to talk, I'm not trying to yeah. be there. Yeah. We had the opposite kind of situation once, it was a Christmas one, where we had quiet sitting, everybody talking, and this one girl couldn't do that. And she, we couldn't have her just being loud and obnoxious, but she ended up just sort of pacing behind everybody back and forth. And she would interject when she she was listening, she was paying attention, but she just couldn't sit. And so just letting her have that. And there are people that can't do that. And I, this is one of the things that I went to this seminar that I went to. And they have, like, little, uh, there are people, kids, adults, fidgets. that need little fidget fidgets. things. You know, you can put them on your pen or whatever. They have um, these cushions. That when you sit in the chair, they move. So Those you are feel like wobble seats. seats. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they said, you know, I, it didn't even occur to me. I teach a confirmation class, and um, in the class, in the small group section of the class, this one boy just kept tilting back his chair and kept it. And I, Daniel, which chair? All six legs on the floor, you know, <laughs> constantly saying something like that. And then I went to this class, and they said that balance is a thing for some people. And it's not like he wasn't paying attention, just like this girl who's pacing back and forth. It's not like they're not paying attention. They actually need that to pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I was like, oh, I'm going to be like put so calm about this. I'm not going to. And it wasn't an issue. You know, if I didn't make it an issue, it wasn't an issue unless he fell on his head, I suppose. I mean, that would have been <laughs> something. But he usually had his hands on the table, but he just needed that, yeah. that balance. And so you have to be aware that there are kids out there that, that yeah, need no. something different or just experience. Discussions different or, or think different, you know, like and, and those kids messages. are are not necessarily the kids who are on the spectrum for lack of a better term. No. Um, but a lot of your kids who who do that are on the spectrum do have that sensory component to it where they need they their bodies crave that sensory input. Um, so you, those are the kids you're gonna see that are doing the you know, not not necessarily the the stereotypical rocking, but just, you know, moving, moving around, rocking, the feet are going, they're tapping, they're doing, because they, they need to have that sort of an input because it regulates their world a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's tough to, it's tough to be dysregulated in a, in, in a place like this because there's no real way to get yourself on the same page as everybody else, and it's, and it's tough. Some, some kids, um, sound is a trigger, and the, the, no the noise level can actually spark the
these problems. We had a kid last year who we discovered this rather late in the year in the week, and he couldn't pass his swim test. And we figured out in the end he could not stand having the kids standing around cheering him on while he was trying. So we actually set up his next one so that they all got away. And they all came rushing. They wanted to cheer him because he actually made it. The, the fourth day, he made it. And as he was approaching the line, everyone started running over and we're like, back up, back up. And he finally got there and then they swarmed him. But it was, you know, they almost blew it because they didn't get it. They were like, you can't go to him yet. He's not there. And then he, met, he passed it. Took four tries and he got it. So, but you guys, the fact that you're sitting here is means that you guys are open to. Not that I think that people that aren't sitting here aren't, but um, you're open to, to hearing and, and getting that information and using it. So that's awesome because it's hard. It's hard for all of us because we, you know. Like I said, we start on Sunday night, and, and if a parent has put on the, the sheet that a kid might have a difficulty, or might have shared when they drop them off, um, you might have a, an inkling of that you might need to do a little bit different, but you might have no idea either. So it's you know it's it's hard to to be the person in charge and not know what to do. So well, and it's not just kids with special needs; all kids. Right. You were saying everyone has. Yep. Days and things when these happen, mm -hmm. so they're good strategies for anyone. It yeah. is definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Right. Yeah. I was just th my my thought process was the the three years that I've counseled now we've had at least one kid who doesn't fit into the box that we want the kids to fit into. Um, that our experience tells us they should fit into. Um, be, and you know, growing up, I was talking about this with somebody else. When I was in school, we had you no know, kids with, special, with any sort of a different needs in my direct line of sight. Um, you know, kids, these kids are at, a, at an advantage because our other campers, because they've probably got one or two or five kids that are not a general ed kid in their classroom. Um, so they're probably dealing with it a whole lot better than we are because they've got more experience with it than we do. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a whole new world out there, too, that kids are not being hidden away, not being kept home, not, and, and nor should they be. We just need to know how to help them be successful doing the things that they want to do. So I, I appreciate that you're here. Yes? I just wanted Sarah and my um, it's a Silver Lake success story because my Sarah, um, who is 31 years old and has intellectual disabilities, was exactly what you were talking about. The sensory overload was just something. So when, in the social hall, she could not handle this. One of her birthdays was here. And this is the specialness of this place. 300 kids fought happy birthday for her on her birthday. Absolute silence oh, as they thought <laughs> happy birthday for her. I mean, she now is a kid who's on the microphone and everything else, but this is also a place where you know kids can be affirmed and welcomed. So it, it just is you know, it gives me chills even to tell the story. Yeah. It was just a great it was just a great Well like thing. I said, I think that I think that the, 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 the conferees are are way better at this than the adults are because they're they're experiencing it. Um, they're not they they're experiencing it, experiencing it since kindergarten or preschool, as opposed to you know like I said I, we never they were out. Um, so um, so yeah, thank you guys so much.